Aloha. It's that time in the week again when your favorite show, Condo Insider, comes on. And I'm with my wonderful co-host, Jane Sugimura. And we're going to talk about the legislature. It's finally over. What bills pass? And this was the craziest, hardest working year I think we've ever had with regard to uh, the various bills that came forward, particularly Senate Bill 551, which the governor placed on his veto list, along with 19 other or a total of 20 other bills to veto, and it didn't get vetoed. And I think it's due to a lot of work by a lot of people, but let's get right into it, Jane. Hi. Senate Bill 551, hi, yes. nice to see you again. Nice to be here. And briefly recap what 551 was about. 551 basically confirms that associations can do non-judicial foreclosure without express language, you know, in the um, uh, in their uh, uh, in the statute, and because uh, that was the issue, it, you know, the statute doesn't have any express language allowing them to do it, uh, and so uh, the there was a supreme, uh, not a supreme court, an IC, an intermediate court of appeals decision that basically said that you know condos were, were not allowed to do uh, non-judicial foreclosures. And this statute basically said, yes, they did. And, you know, 10 years ago, when the original act was passed, uh, the legislatures, you know, ex expressed their intent in the uh, committee re reports. So it was really clear that even though there's no express language saying you can do non-judicial foreclosures, even though you don't have, uh, you know, the language, uh, you know, that it, ref that, that, you, that it, based on a mortgage, you know. So, I know we've talked about this act several times on the show. Right. What was the harm to associations if the governor did veto this bill, which he did not? Well, number one, it affects their collection process because, you know, it, it, you know they wouldn't be able to use a non-judicial uh, foreclosure process, which is cheaper. Plus, it exposes them to a lot of to lawsuits by uh, attorneys out there who are basically looking to sue the associations for these non-judicial foreclosures that happened between 2008 and 2011 before the law was changed. So, you know, the associations, in theory, these plaintiff's attorneys would say, well, uh, the, uh, the appellate court said what you've done is unlawful, and they would go to all the people who didn't pay, say, hire me so I can sue them for damages. Right, and, and, and besides that, you know, the insurance, for associations that has been affected. I mean, there was, there's some carriers who won't, you know, insure for foreclosure claims. And the premiums have gone up. You know, so, and, and if this, uh, if, uh, if this uh, bill had been vetoed, it would have been worse. But I, I you know, uh, I thank God that it wasn't uh, vetoed and that it will become the law. And, you know, we have a lot of people to thank for it. I mean, this didn't happen. I, I think just by chance, there were a lot of people who worked very hard uh, to make sure uh, to persuade the governor uh, not to veto the bill. Well, because what happened is he put it on the veto list, one right. of 20 bills, and he had until July 9th to firm up which ones he would veto. It was kind of like a pre-notice of what he's going to veto. Right. And so what we did as an industry, we kicked in and did a lot of different things. And tell us some of, tell, tell everybody what, what was entailed in this. Well, I think, you know, what we did is we, went, we reached out to our constituency, right? The, the, the associations, the, the property management companies reached out to their clients and, 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 you know, basically passed along a message that was created by some of the condo attorneys in town and CAI. Uh, they basically said, okay, this is what you do. You call the governor, this is his email address, this is his phone number. And you call them and tell them not to veto 551 because, okay, all you, and the because, would, and then you just put in a, a short blurb about because we want to avoid, you know, uh, 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 you know, frivolous lawsuits against us for things that happened almost 10 years ago. Plus, we need the non-judicial foreclosure so that we can collect our maintenance fees in an efficient manner so that we can pay for our operations. And so the industry jumped up because I was told by one person that they, they believe that the governor had over 400 uh, email or website messages from our constituents saying, please allow 551 to go through and why it was important to them. 
And I know the CAI sent their uh, email list out. Hawaii Council did the same. They did their email blast. And uh, Paul Ireland came up with a form, basically, that said, this is how you contact the governor. These are all his numbers and contact information. And th he, he, this is what the bill is about. Here there are some issues or, you know, some talking points. And all of that was sent, you know, on, our, on the Hawaii Council uh, email blast to, oh. to all of our uh, members and constituency and, and, and basically told, you know, you need to do this. We all need you. You know, we need your help because this, because if you do nothing, the governor's going to veto the bill. Well, let's take just a couple, of the, a couple of the main players who really put a lot of hours and energy into that. Let's recognize them by name. Okay. That, I, I know Ann Anderson and Larry McGuire. Uh, right. put in a lot of time. They did a lot of writing. And John Morris uh, was the one who, who uh, authored the article that, have, uh, that occurred, you know, that appeared in the, what is it, the Hawaii, um, what's the Civil name? Beat. Civil Beat. Civil uh, Beat. Civil Beat newspaper. And um, Paul Island, also from Ann Anderson's firm. Right, and Bryson Chow. And Bryson Chow. And we can't forget you, Jane Sugimura. <laughs> you know, I mean, you put a lot of time and energy into that. And I think the people out there need to know that this didn't come cheap. There were thousands upon thousands of dollars spent, not just in people's time, but because we needed to hire PR specialists and, and people who could help us put together the best picture for this. And, as you all out there go to the CAI and the HCCA events, recognize you're supporting and helping build a war chest to prevent bad things from happening to us. So we support all of you out there, and particularly all of you who sent in testimony. It's a very important, critical part, and I'm sure the governor, on top of our PR efforts, being besieged by, I think 400 is a lot of testimony. Yeah, 400 is a lot of testimony. Well, and, well, besides, and, and you and Phil Nerney went to uh, see the Attorney General. That's right. To talk about this bill. And so, you know, so you, so you guys, you know, that, that, that took time and effort. And so, you know, there were a lot of people who were, who were uh, involved in making sure that the governor uh, got the message about why he had to allow Senate Bill 551 to become law. Well, it is law now. It is law now. And I think we should mention before we go on to the other bills that the SB 551 also had a couple other parts to it. And that was that owners would be notified that if they are being foreclosed on by their association, it doesn't excuse them not paying their mortgage. And furthermore, they would have a right to mediation. And furthermore, if you're in the active military, you can't use non-judicial foreclosure. Right, you have to do judicial foreclosure. Right. So there were some enhancements to the current process to protect our, our veterans, who we thank for their service, as well as to make sure the People who don't understand, they fully understand what their obligation and rights are as a result of this bill. So it's, it's not just we can continue on as is. There's some new obligations on our part on notice and, and, and those types of things. Right. Oh, and we have to uh, thank the governor. The oh. governor for signing, you know, for not vetoing the bill. Absolutely. You know, I've said many times in this show that our legislators, whether it be a representative or a senator or the governor or the mayor or the, the, the council people, they're doing the best they can. They don't really understand our industry as close as we might understand mm -hmm. it. And so it's hard for them because they get competing points of views and because they don't live it every day, they have to make business judgments. Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, we think the governor did the right thing and we want to thank Governor David Ige for uh, balancing everything out and realizing that this added more protection for our seniors and our fixed income people to make sure that uh, associations can ensure the cash flow for people who don't pay their uh, maintenance fees. Right. So we thank you, Governor. And uh, let's go on to a couple other bills that were passed this year. You want to talk about House Bill 61, or, or I should say now Act 192, right. Priority that's the, of Payments? That, that's the Priority of Payments. And, and this, this is just a, a, a carry forward from a, a bill that was passed, uh, I think it was last year, Act 195. And that's where, we, we, where the uh, Priority of Payments policy was basically deleted. And that priority of payments basically said that the board could adopt um, a schedule as to who, when the monthly payments came in, how it would be applied and in what order. And on that schedule were late fees, attorney's fees, interest, and then uh, the common expenses. 
And what that did is it ended up in, you know, uh, creating delinquencies and some confusion because if you're on sure pay, if you're the, uh, the owner on sure pay, you don't get notice until there's a substantial amount that's owed. And it, it did cause some, some issues. And so, uh, but when that, the, 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 the Act 195 repealed the policy. But what it, did, what it didn't do is it didn't clarify, well, what do you do with this extra money that gets you know, submitted by the uh, a homeowner? And so what, what uh, uh, Bill 61 does, the new bill that, that does the clarification, it says that the association can prioritize the payments, but the maintenance fees get paid first. In other words, when the monthly payment comes in, it gets applied to the maintenance fees first. And if there's anything left over, then it gets applied in a, in a particular order to things like submeter, electricity, and maybe HO6 insurance policies. But the late fees and interest and attorney's fees on collection are at the bottom of the list. I've been asked about it all the time. And I say, well, look at it in this way. There's, there's three types of chargers. There's common chargers. And they might be maintenance fees. They might be reserve assessments. They might be a utility charge where it's a common single electric meter. You know, uh, in some cases, it might be lease rent if the lease is with the association itself and not the individual owner. So it allows you to say that Bill says you have to first apply monies paid to common expenses. Mm -hmm. And so the board can say of the common expenses we have, this is the priority we're going to apply the payments. Mm -hmm. Then you have non-common expenses. It might be storage lockers, might be parking fees. It might be um, an HO6 policy, an insurance deductible. Then in bucket two, they can have a set of priority of payments and how they play the excess cash over the common expenses. Right. And then third bucket is late fees, fines, and interest. Right. That always has to be last. Right. And that's how it's done. And if you think of your visa bill, when you get your visa bill or your, your master bill from the association, you can't say when you write your check, you can't say, well, pay the, Mac the Macy's and not the Nordstrom's or whatever. When you write that check, they apply it to your total. Mm -hmm. In our case, because we're electronic too with the bank, we need to have a way to apply it so we know what the outstanding balance is. Is it a common expense, which can result in foreclosure? Is it a non-common expense? Or is it a fine or a late fee? And so all this did was clarify the intent of Act 195 last right. year. And... Uh, I'm sure people are still confused on it. Electronic voting. Yes, well, that, that's something that's not mandatory, and, I, and it doesn't apply to most associations. I think it's, it, it, it was uh, it, it introduced basically to handle like timeshares and, and large associations uh, that, uh, where, where if you had an election, it would take you hours to count the ballots. And, but, but, but most associations you know, don't have to go through that. And so it doesn't apply to them, but they, they can use it if they want to. It's voluntary. Yeah. And it should be understood, this is not mail voting. This, no. is, this is at the meeting where you have an electronic device that it might be your mobile phone um, that people can vote. And I know of an association in Maui, it's about seven or 800 units. They have 51 percentages of common interests. They have cumulative voting. And their tabulation takes hours. And so, if the board voluntarily adopts uh, the, uh, the use of electronic voting, and of course, electronic voting has to have an audit trail, it has to be in a secure environment, so we can't have Russian voting fraud in our election. Uh, if you can meet all the criteria, it makes sense. And even though I don't know of any app today that 100% meets our requirements, I do know of some software developers working on it. And so, it'll help us in the future. We're just getting up to the current time. and and the current model of uh, what's going on. And because we're at time for a break, we're going to take a little one minute break and come right back with some more bills that were now law and all of you are obligated to obey. Aloha. My name is Mark Schlav. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. My program airs every other Monday at one o'clock on Think Tech Hawaii. Most of my programs deal with my own life and law experience. Recently, I interviewed Alex Jempel, who I have known for over 30 years, about his voyage across the sea as a lawyer from Tokyo to Hawaii. Those are the type of stories that I like to bring and like to talk about. 
human stories about law and life. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha, this is Scott Perry, and I'm the host of Let's Talk Hawaii at Think Tech Hawaii. In this show, we're going to be speaking in English and Japanese, and I'm going to use my 30 years of experience to help many Japanese viewers improve their English skills, as well as learning many interesting things about Hawaii. You can catch my show every other Tuesday, 3 p.m. Hawaii time. See you then. Welcome back to Condo Insider. I'm sitting here with my co-host, Jane Sugimura, Hawaii Council of Community Associations. The legislature's over. We've just reviewed some of the critical bills, Senate Bill 551, which confirms an association's right to do a non-judicial foreclosure. We've talked about improvement and understanding on the priority of payment with regard to bill and how you apply maintenance fees. And we've talked about electronic voting. So what else was passed? Well, there was a bill that uh, talked about retaining proxies. And, and you know, I think the, re the rule now is 30 days, and the bill allows, uh, it ex extended it to 90. 90 rather than 30. Right. And, and I think m most associations were keeping them anyway more than 30 days. And the reason why I guess this is important is when you have an election, uh, the owners have a right, or anybody has, or just the owners have a right to, to challenge the vote. And so that's why it's important to keep the proxies and to keep the documentation relating to uh, the election so that people can, you know, exercise that right. Yeah, technically speaking, if uh, with, within 30 days an owner could uh, submit a petition to the board for a special meeting to do a recount. Right. The board can't call a meeting to do a recount. It has to be an owner's request to do a recount of the ballots. Mm -hmm. And then you'd have a meeting, and then you'd have to have the owners vote at that meeting whether they wanted to recount the ballot. And they could, I've seen many meetings, they've called to recount them, and the owners turned it down. You know, so there's a process that goes through, but there were arguments that people were destroying or manipulating or tearing up ballots, and they were destroyed so quickly, no one could do an audit. Mm -hmm. And so by extending it to 90 days just gives additional time, but... Uh, from my experience, most management companies keep them a year or more anyway, and the industry supported it because we didn't see it was really asking us to change anything. And mm -hmm. uh, But to get the actual recount is a bigger hurdle than keeping the proxies under parliamentary procedure. They're going to have to have a special meeting, and the owners are going to have to approve it, and that's going to be a that's challenge. The, you're right, that's the hard part. How about the investment of condominium funds? Okay, but well this allows the uh, condominiums uh, to invest in uh, government money market funds, but they were already investing in them already, and I guess this bill just clarifies that it's okay. Well, you know, and I don't have the exact language here. The, to me, the language in the bill allowed investment in the government money market funds. Mm -hmm. Some people argue, no, it's not government money market funds, the way the law, current law was written. Most of the condos I know invest in government money market funds. So all this did would clarify what the intent was and mm -hmm. prevents problems down the road because right. it's a simple thing. And as we all know, investing, you require principal protected and there's all sorts of obligations that uh, you have to have to have a legal investment. So I think it's just a notice to everybody that, yeah, one of the bullets in your arsenal is going to be uh, invest in government money market funds. And if your board is like not sure what the language means, now they know what it means. And, you know, I think the, that this is necessary because more and more, I mean, uh, the buildings have to uh, come, come up with larger and larger reserve amounts. And, you know, it's hard to keep your money, what is it, 250000 that you're that is government insured? And, and that's why we have to have different depositories for all of our money? Not to be sarcastic, do you know how hard it would be to keep your balance of reserve funds if you had to pay off all these non-judicial foreclosure oh. lawsuits that were bogus, <laughs> and you had to take your money and use it for something else, it would have been a disaster for right. Congress. But thank you, Governor. Yeah. Anyway, revival, or, uh, revival of 514A is the title, but because we know that 514A was repealed as of July 1 right. last year, and now it's been revived for one year, but it's not what everybody thinks. Right, it's not the whole statute. It's only 
the portion that uh, applies to developers uh, who, you know, because condominiums are created by statute. And so there were certain condominiums that were created by 514A, and those, some very few units uh, have not yet been sold. And so in order for them to sell those units under the current law, they had to have for 514A revived. Otherwise, they'd have to go through this long, drawn-out process and have their public reports redone and re reapproved, and 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 uh, I guess it was just too much hassle. So I guess what it is, you had a bunch of developers who formed condominiums under 514A, who didn't sell all of them and wanted right. to sell them, and they were too low, low the last 12 months to go ahead and and get their act in order. And so now all of a sudden they painted themselves in a corner because 514A was repealed right. and they couldn't sell their units without spending gobbles of money to redo their governing documents. So the legislature came in, rightfully so, saved them and said, look, we'll give you another year to get this fixed up. Right. And that's how I look at it. Right. But from the beginning, 514B, the governance part of 514B, trumped 514A forever. Right. So this is an effect condos. If you were once a 514A, this doesn't mean you're back to being a 514A. Right. You're a 514B unless you're a developer-owned unit and you're a developer. Right. So we're only mentioning it today because we want to clear it up. It doesn't affect any of you who are 514B, who were 514A, that are no longer controlled by the developer. Right. Public report. <laughs> anyway, moving along on our little topic here. We have the handyman exemption. Right. And this one, the, the handyman exemption has been ra uh, raised from 1000 to 1500 and, and And the 1500 doesn't include the GEP. Right. Right? So, so it means that you, you can, uh, a lot more of your work can be uh, applied that way. Well, I think people may not realize, I'll, I'll, I'll give this as an example. My, my dates may be a little wrong, but... The $1,000 handyman exemption, which includes both material and labor, and then included general excise tax, has been in existence for like 20 years. You know, it's never been raised. And of course, we all know everything's gone up in price. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of debate. You know, I mean, certain contractors who have licenses don't like it being raised. But the reality of it is, it's time to raise it. It was raised to fifteen hundred dollars, including labor and material. But the GET is not included in the fifteen hundred, so that's fifteen hundred and sixty dollars are simple. So it gave a little more work being able to be done by handyman. It was mm -hmm. just kind of brought up the numbers to modern times, is how I would describe it. Although you can argue and that wasn't enough money, but. You should know that now currently, uh, as of July 1, it's $1,500, and plus GET is what a handyman can do. But I would caution every one of you out there that if you have a job that's $3,000, you can't write two contracts with the same contractor and give him one job for $1,500 and then another job for $1,500 and get around the law, because the law is very clear. You can't separate these parts of the job in order to violate your obligations under this law. Is that right? Yeah. I said that correctly? So any prediction next year what we're going to be facing? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I know we have to go back and um, deal with two sunsets. Well, uh, one is for the um, priority of payment. And I have already spoken to uh, Senator Baker, and so she's prepared to draft a bill to eliminate the sunset in that law. What I hear mostly in the industry, and they've asked us to explore, and we've talked about this, is community associations, HOAs. Right. 421 J, 421 J. 421 J. Trying to create an expansion of that law to provide the basic protections you have in 514B with regard to documents and voting and those types of things. So I think as an industry, that's something we should take a close look at and get ready for. And and uh, this wasn't a good year to introduce that. We, we were really busy this right. year. Right. And in fact, we do, we have, uh, we kind of have a template because uh, uh, Representative Johansson introduced a bill that is part four, uh, 
421J and Part 514D. And so we're going to have to start working on that now to get it you know, ready for the legislature next year. Yeah, but I think that's a good thing to do. And at that time, we were always out of time. And I have probably another 20 bills here that kind of touch on our industry, but really uh, uh, don't have that much significance to us. So we'll pass those to a future show. Okay. But anyway, we want to thank all of you for being interested in association living and watching Condo Insider. And also, we want you know to we want to uh, let you know that we really appreciate your help in uh, getting uh, Senate Bill five five one passed. And it does take a village; it takes a whole lot, a whole huge village, to get some stuff done uh, in in the government if you want it done. Well, and uh, we thank you for your special efforts in that as well. So thank you for watching Condo Insider. Ahui ho! We'll see you next week.